So why don't we have steam-powered planes? It's a question that gets asked on occasion, and it's not as silly as it seems at face value, because, I mean, when you think about it, a steam-powered airplane? That doesn't... what? But, I mean, steam engines are just that engines, and theoretically you could use one to power an aircraft, couldn't you? And the answer is yes. Yes, in fact, it's been done before. Really, honestly, multiple times, in fact. And before we get into the reasons why most aircraft, in fact, pretty much all of them, don't utilize steam engines to power themselves, let's go into the numerous times this was, in some way, attempted. And the earliest example actually goes back all the way to 1842, believe it or not, in the form of what was called the Aerial Steam Carriage. This particular old-school aircraft definitely looks old-school, and was nicknamed by her inventors Ariel, which is sweet and cute, actually. The design was patented by William Samuel Henson and John Stringfellow of Britain, but the design was never successful. They only managed to test a small model, which was actually steam-powered and did apparently fly in 1848, so they were certainly on the right track. In 1852, Henry Giffard wound up flying a steam-powered dirigible over Paris. It was only three horsepower, but it did work, and was technically the first powered aircraft. But that's a dirigible, an airship. That's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about steam-powered airplanes. There's a big difference in terms of how lift is being generated here, so let's just press forward. In 1861, another inventor named Gustave Ponton de Americourt created another small steam-powered craft, which she actually described as a helicopter. Then, in 1874, Felix du Temple actually managed to achieve the first manned heavier-than-air powered flight. Yes, predating the Wright brothers, in a steam-powered aluminum monoplane. But... You might be saying, well, if he did that, why are the Wright brothers credited with the airplane and everything? Well, that's because he did this on a downhill run, and the creation did not achieve level flight. It did take off, but didn't actually pull up at all, and slammed into the ground. It, it really wasn't a, a rousing success in that way. But Temple was again on the right track in terms of how to do it. In 1877, Enrico Forlanini of Italy managed to fly a model, a steam-powered helicopter, in Milan. In 1882, Alexander Mosheisky also constructed another steam-powered airplane, but this again didn't achieve any sustained flight. In 1890, Clement Adder also constructed another monoplane that was indeed steam-powered, who he named Ioli. He managed to fly it on October 9th, 1890, a distance of roughly 50 meters. But the steam engine he chose for this wasn't able to propel it for any sustainability. While he did prove that heavier-than-air flight was possible, again, just as Temple did, his design never achieved anything phenomenal. He tried it at least three more times, two of them in front of the French Ministry of War, and it's actually still debated as to whether or not he ever really attained controlled flight. But regardless, he was never able to get any funding for further development. In 1894, Sir Haram Stevens Maxim constructed and tested a rail-mounted steam-powered aircraft testbed. This thing apparently weighed 3.6 tons and had a wingspan of 110 feet. And Maxim actually wasn't looking to really take off with this thing, quite literally. It really was meant to be a test bed to see how lift could be generated using different wing configurations, what would be best for an actual test flight on an actual plane. But when it was used, it generated sufficient lift to the point that it tried desperately to break free of the test track and fly. Indeed, she took off, but since she was never meant to actually, you know, fly at all, and therefore had no control services, it crashed immediately. But it did demonstrate that, um, wow, wings work really well. In 1896, Samuel Pierpont Langley tested a handful of unpiloted steam-powered models. Just the following year, in 1897, Carl Richard Nyberg's airplane, known as Flugin, was tested and they were steam-powered, but they were never able to achieve more than just a few short hops. Sustained flight did not happen with this design, and poor Nyberg was often ridiculed for his attempts because he stuck with it for so long, but it was a worthy effort. In 1899, Gustav Whitehead built 
and was reported to have flown, but it's not clear, another steam-powered airplane in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A man named Louis Devarich was said to have been injured when the plane crashed into an upper story of an apartment building. Whitehead himself would claim to have flown a steam-powered aircraft in Hartford, Connecticut, as well as having been visited by one of the Wright brothers well before 1903. But modern historians are not convinced about his claims. The flights have never been verified. There's no photographs, news stories, or anything that actually confirms that any of this happened. And there's also no evidence that either of the Wrights ever visited Whitehead at any point. This one's probably not really something you should put a whole lot of belief into. In 1902, Lehman Gilmore said that he flew a another steam-powered aircraft on May 15th of that year. But he made this claim in 1927? What? And there's no confirmation. I, I smell lies. Moving into the era of more proper airplane design in 1920, a design known as the Bristol Tramp was supposed to be a steam-powered airplane by the Bristol Aeroplane Company. They were utilizing a steam turbine set up to power this thing, but it turned out it actually generated too much power, and they couldn't get a reliable boiler and condenser set up for the thing, so the whole project wound up being abandoned. In 1931, Harry Crossland Taff designed and did build another steam-powered aircraft. It was actually meant to be flown by round-the-world aviator Clyde Pangborn. But there's no record of that ever happened, and I, I feel like Pangborn would have said something if it did. Moving into the most well-known example, and by well-known, I mean you still probably haven't heard of it, but still, in 1933, George D. Bessler and William J. Bessler created a prototype steam-powered biplane which was based on the Travel Air 2000, which were open cockpit biplanes produced in the United States in the late 1920s by the Travel Air Manufacturing Company. There were a lot of those biplanes in the air as they were quite good, so it's made sense to use one as a test bed for this little experiment. And this one we know flew, because there were plenty of witnesses and actual footage of the thing. Yeah, it worked. The aircraft flew out several times at the Oakland airport, and it was powered by a two-cylinder, 150-horsepower, double-expansion, V-twin, reciprocating engine that weighed roughly 500 pounds. It had been designed by the Doble Steam Motors Company, as well as Bessler, and the aircraft had some pretty interesting features. It's one of the earliest examples of a short takeoff and landing aircraft that I'm familiar with. The reason is that the steam engine was actually super easy to reverse, even while the prop was rotating. So, upon landing, the pilot could just shift the thing into reverse almost instantly, and slow the plane down astonishingly fast using the reverse thrust. It was certainly interesting, and a solid proof of concept, but it never led to any production runs. In 1934, newspapers actually reported on another steam-powered aircraft that had been designed over in Germany by one Mr. Uetner, who was the chief engineer of Klingenberg Electric Works in Berlin. This particular design was said to use a revolving boiler combined with a steam turbine. It was meant to achieve 260 miles per hour and be capable of 60 to 70 hours non-stop flight, which sounds insane. Not sure I believe that, but either way, it was never built. The reporter who actually wrote the article would then be arrested? Yep. And no more was heard about it. In 1938, another British company, Aero Turbines Limited, did design another steam turbine engine that was similar to Uetner's. But before any further development could happen, that company ceased to exist, so... You know. In 1944, there was a proposal for a steam-powered version of the Messerschmitt ME-264. It was to use a steam turbine that would develop over 6,000 horsepower and utilize fuel that was a mixture of powdered coal and petroleum. And the main advantages of the setup were that it could produce consistent power output at all altitudes and not be very high maintenance. But again, it was never built. And in the 1960s, there were some concept drawings made for Don Johnson of Thermodynamic Systems Incorporated over in Newport Beach, California. This was spent to install a steam engine on a Hughes 300 helicopter. The design was compact and cylindrical, double-acting uniflow. But no prototype was ever actually made. And that's, um, that's that. That's, that's where we're at with it. And now that we've gone through all the examples of the attempts and mostly failures of utilizing steam in this particular capacity, why, uh, why, why don't we do that? Why, why isn't that done more? 
And the answer is mostly down to weight. Doubtless most of you are aware of a steam locomotive, which is of course big and chunky. Even the smaller ones are particularly heavy. And yes, steam engines generally are. You need to generate steam, so you need a boiler in some capacity. And you need water for the boiler. And all this kind of compounds into a power to weight ratio that isn't necessarily the greatest if you look at it in most other context. The reason why steam locomotives in particular get away with it is that they kind of need to be heavy. Because they pull so much weight, they also in themselves kind of need to be pretty heavy in order to get any traction. Their attractive effort would be non-existent if they didn't weigh enough to actually, you know, have weight on their driving wheels. Large ships also utilize steam power, and they're already pretty heavy, so again, it wasn't a big deal with them. But in other avenues, the power to weight ratio becomes a little more uh, problematic. Cars, for example, don't necessarily need to be super heavy, since they rarely pull anything. True, trucks, for example, will sometimes pull a trailer, but you get better results out of a normal internal combustion engine. And planes, the weight is super important, probably more important than pretty much any other kind of vehicle because they have to fly. And when you have to fly, if you are too heavy, you are not going to do that thing at all. The thing about steam engines is that they, by comparison to pretty much any other form, tend to lean on the heavier side. And it's easy to understand why when you think about the fact that unlike every other type of engine, they need two forms of fuel, whereas the others pretty much only need the one mainly. It's true, internal combustion also needs, like, motor oil and a little bit of water, or coolant, but for the most part, the fuel's coming from the gas. But in the steam engine, you need two main types. You need whatever combustible is designed to use, whether it be coal or oil, and then you need a lot of water. Like, a lot of water. All of that needs to be stored on the vehicle, and then you need a boiler for the water which is something that doesn't really apply to anything else. It's true, there are very compact steam engines. Steam motors, for example, totally exist and could be utilized to power a plane, but they would still need some kind of boiler to get the steam in the first place. This adds weight to the creation, and it's just not efficient at the end of the day when you compare it to the other options that have been available over the course of history. Unless you were able to create a design that would drop the weight drastically, but not drop the power output at the same time, it just isn't gonna be something that could be utilized on a mass scale. And some of you might be saying, well, what if we were able to recycle the steam? What if you didn't need that much water in the grand scheme of things? What if the engine didn't release any exhaust steam at all and you just recycled it? And okay, let's play that game. Let's say we made a design that could in fact recycle all the steam that's utilized in the engine. For one thing, doing that even on the ground in a locomotive has been very problematic historically. It's not easy to do that, not nearly as easy as you would think, at least not efficiently. In order to accomplish this, you would probably need a bunch of extra stuff, which every time you add extra stuff, like a condenser, you would be adding weight to the creation. So we're talking about adding things when we're trying to drop weight. You see the problem here? Because I get you, if the steam engine you're proposing is an entirely closed system, the water is just in it, and it turns the steam then back into water, then back into steam again, theoretically, yeah, you wouldn't need to worry about carrying a large amount of water, you just need a fuel to heat it in the first place. And in that form, it may even be more efficient than a traditional engine, or even a modern jet. Yes, it is theoretically possible but you would have to actually do that. And all that research and time would be expensive. We're talking about shrinking a great deal of different mechanics into a very compact form. Granted, I have read some articles that argue that perhaps the future of air travel would be in steam, because in the theoretical option I've given you, it may actually be a lot more fuel efficient. And with rising fuel costs of modern jets, it's not unreasonable that we could go full steampunk on this, and I would be down for further research being done. But as it stands right now, it isn't as far as I can tell. But it would be pretty cool to see more research being done into the concept. After all, steam is a proven technology. All we would have to do is shrink it down into a form that could be utilized on a mass scale in air travel. Can it be done? I don't know. Right now they're so focused on using batteries to power airplanes I don't even know right now. But you know, what if we did like a hybrid? Like maybe the battery would use less power if it just had to heat a surface. 
and that surface could be used to heat the steam and the water and it like then you wouldn't have to worry about the secondary fuel it'd just be the weight of the battery and the water that that might be something to look into i'm just spitballing here i am not an engineer so don't ask me serious questions about this i only know what i've read but it's been tried it has it's been done so that's something and with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Jack Carson's River Videos, Lord Off 444, Royal Hudson 2060, Isafer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Travis Salinsky, Jared Brussel, JBL Explorers, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mark Holding, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, No, Eric Hutton, Kurt Forkham, Ohio Trucker 1, Mitchell Cole, Mr. Sleepy, Dr. Racer 78, AET Museum, Railroad Preserver 2000, Williard Conklin, Windy City Rails, Liam Wright, DM Travel Typhoon, Harry, Hannah Bird, Western Colorado History, Ryan Wehefer, Drew Debris, George Kenny, and of course, my dad. Till next time. This is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.